Good. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So today is January 17th, and we're doing uh, episode two of Michael Kearns. Uh, Mark Simon's on the camera. I'm Cheryl Revkin doing the interview. There are a couple of pictures of um, Michael's daughter, Catherine, who was called Tia at the time, um, here. Him kissing her, her with a french fry. <laughs> this uh, great little heart photo says, Daddy's girl. And then here's a more current uh, picture of okay. Catherine. She's away at uh, college in England right now. Also, this uh, book, uh, The Truth is Bad Enough, which is a quote from Michael's mother, <laughs> um, shows Michael on the cover of The Happy Hustler without a shirt. <laughs> And um, his name down here. And uh, this book was sold just recently at Michael's one man show, autobiographical show, uh, which uh, sold out the first night, and the second night was just um, about 10 days ago. Um, so, this is part two, I was saying episode two. Uh, and we <laughs> had gotten. We had gotten to kind of around the 80s. Uh, also, you and Tom had split up, and I don't think we talked about uh, Philip or Philippe? Was Philip. Philip. So, do you want to start with that relationship, maybe? That would be good. Um, Philip happened right in the midst of the whole AIDS, you know, crisis. Maybe not, at, well, 89, 88, 89. Mm. I had not been tested when we first got together. He had been tested, and so that was one of the real reasons for me to get tested. You know, in those days, there was a lot of get tested, don't get tested. Right. It's not politically correct to get tested, blah, 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 blah. So I, was, I think it was a good way to deny it for as long as you could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that well, in retrospect? Well, and there, there wasn't much said. treatment anyway. Well, and the treatment there was, as it turns out, wasn't so good. Mm -hmm. So I met Philip initially at Max Baths, right before its demise. You know, right before it was uh, closed, well, shut no down. Law shut down. Yeah. And where was that? On Hyperion mm -hmm. in Silver, mm -hmm. right? And it was uh, it was the hopping place for maybe ten years, I think. Right. Like, and why didn't you say why the baths were shut down? Huh? Well, the baths were shut down because of HIV. Right. Um, and a lot of them were shut down. I think Max hung on. I think, you know, there were, of course, the rumors about people were being paid off and who knows what was going on. It was all pretty ugly and pretty scary and like, okay, now they're closing down. You know, there was a lot of talk of now they're closing down the baths, will they be closing down the bars? bars. Which was a legitimate concern, you know, because of all the not knowing, because of the sort of ignorance about transmission, Still, people didn't know. Well, still to this day, people don't know. Right, I mean, right. we're in the 21st century and people don't know. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, he, he and I met there and then we didn't see each other, but it was a big connection, I felt. And then we saw each other again uh, in Palm Springs. And then we saw each other for the next four years. And I knew he was positive that I got tested and I was positive. So, we were... Uh, positive, positive mm -hmm. couple. How, how, how did you feel when you found out you were positive? Did you have some kind of emotional reaction? Or? Oh yeah, and... Where did you get tested? I've talked about this. I, I was, I had a doctor at Cedars then, because I still had SAG insurance, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, he was, he was my doctor. He was my regular doctor. And then I, I got tested. I mean, there's another story about this doctor, which I'm not, I don't even know the name. He, he was... He was my regular... Who was he? His name? Okay. Stephen Eumann uh -huh. was his name. And at, he was one of the Cedars. initial mm -hmm. HIV doctors. Right, right. There were only a few. Right. He was one of them. And he happened to be this heterosexual guy who um, sort of looked like he was out of a checkoff play. <laughs> you know, beard and little guy. I mean, he looked a little like Mark. He looked like he could be doing checkoff. <laughs> but he didn't look like, you know, you would he would be necessarily someone that I could confide in or be close to. Mm. 
So then the HIV thing happened, and he was my HIV doctor. Well, how did I feel? Uh, well, first of all, I said, I do not have to come in. I told him that. You can tell me on the phone. I talked to him in, at the initial, when I had the test. And you know, in those days, people went in, and, and because they thought people would you'd freak out or something. And I, I was pretty certain I'd be positive. So it wasn't. Now, I said this thing that I, I don't regret saying, but people went nuts, you know. I mean, anything I said or anything I say seems to elicit some uh, dramatic response. I said that the moment I heard that I was HIV positive, it was like everything went from black and white to color, like the movie The Wizard of Oz. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's a good thing, because some of the color in The Wizard of Oz was horrifying. Mm -hmm. I mean, those monkeys, to this day, scare me. So I wasn't saying that it meant everything was good. I'm just saying that it meant that there was a new way of looking at mm -hmm. things. And I saw everything. I literally, it was literal in that moment. It was like oh my God, everything seems brighter or, mm -hmm. or more. And that was something good about that too. Mm -hmm. uh, so I proceeded. But mm -hmm. that doctor, as it turns out, you know, we maintained this relationship and he was good to me and I felt he was a really good doctor. But when it came time to adopt Catherine, uh -huh. I never in a million years would have anticipated when I went in and I said, would you write a letter? saying that the likelihood of my, um, death. <laughs> of my not death, uh, not, death. Uh -huh. not dying, of my not dying was good and that it seemed, now this was pre-protease inhibitors yeah. and he wrote that letter. Oh, he did. Because well, he was a father. Uh -huh. And I think that that's how we connected. Mm. I talked to him about his son mm -hmm. and I was shocked when he said yes to the letter. And I was also shocked by the, oh, <laughs> <laughs> You want to be in the picture. <laughs> I was shocked by the... Uh, you couldn't have planned that. You silly. What do He's you comforting want? you. What do you want? Yes, really comforting. This one's the comforter. Um, so it, it, was, it was so surprising. I, I mean, I, I wasn't... He said he'd write the letter. I wasn't surprised at that. But then when I saw the content of the letter, it's like there's every reason to believe that Mr. Kearns mm -hmm. can be a father and... Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And that letter meant a lot. Yeah. You know, um, I, I was talking to Mark a little bit about this, but um, in your story just so far, um, I feel like you must have experienced along the way a lot of fear in your life that maybe you covered up, uh, you know, with, or maybe you uh, used a little bit in your acting and maybe you um, drank and did drugs or some of your sexual practices or something had to do with fear uh, but when you um, actually found out you were HIV positive do, did any of those feelings rise to the surface you know fear that you might have felt when you were a child and your parents were fighting or you know going out in the world coming out as gay as an actor you took a lot of risks in your life I think really I think that maybe because I'd taken so many risks, mm. that, that 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 wasn't as big as it was for other people. Mm -hmm. And also, I didn't have the gay identity issue to deal with. I mean, a lot of people are coming out on mm. two, you two know. fronts. Also, mm -hmm. you know, by that time, I think everyone thought I was HIV positive. When I was doing those plays and, and doing stage, for instance, which was before I was diagnosed, which was before I had an a positive uh, declaration. Mm -hmm. I think people assumed I was HIV positive, mm -hmm. but my own fear we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that I had fear, and I know that Jim Pickett was really the person I spoke to most about it. Mm -hmm. And he and I would admit our fears to each other. Mm -hmm. Fear of dying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fear of what you'd go through dying. And as it turned out, I went through his death with him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, who would die first? We played that game all the time. And we would also laugh a lot about it, make fun of it. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, which was really, mm -hmm. you know, all you could do at some point. Yeah. And thank God we both had kind of mm -hmm. dark senses of humor. Yeah. 
What, uh, can you talk a little bit about the stage and about Jim? Yeah, Jim and I, um, he did a play, he wrote a play called Bathhouse Benediction, mm -hmm. which was this short one-act play, short, like 25 minutes, and it became kind of this sensation. It was um, this guy in a bathhouse, this was pre-AIDS, pre well, on the cusp of AIDS, it wasn't pre-AIDS, it was, it was before AIDS really exploded. So. There is a sensibility in the play, but it's not spoken. And this play had this hot guy in it who happened to be this straight guy who happened to be the bright guy for the part. And he's very sexy and, and uh, he was really good. And it was lit beautifully. It was this little theater. I can't even remember. Vermont. Mark, do you remember Vermont? And I, I don't. I do. Was it, it, it was on Vermont? Yeah. It was in Vermont and some side street down, pretty down uh -huh. further, not in this section. Of right, more in the Silver I, Lake area. I, I almost think of it as being more by by Hoover. No, that was the celebration. That was this the was celebration. another theater. Right, and I, all I can remember is the corner. I don't think it's there now, and I don't, uh -huh. I don't know what's there. Probably a store. But that's where it was so. staged. But that's where it was staged, staged and I, there's a point to this because uh, eventually. It was staged at night. It was we did this. We built this whole thing around it because mm -hmm. the, the show was twenty minutes. So we had steam, like you were in the bathhouse when you right, walked right, in. Right. The, right there, right. we had some dummies of men, <laughs> like my show mannequins, <laughs> uh, with towels around them. You got a key instead of a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> so we had this whole sort of environmental <laughs> thing going, and people came in droves mm -hmm. and it ran for months like two nights a week but it ran for months and you s starred in it i directed it he wrote it oh you directed it yeah you didn't act in no it. i didn't act it was i just acted in it later uh, but i, I never no the actor was great i mm -hmm. i would direct it it was a one-man show mm -hmm. oh, oh and this was before jerker right this was before yes. jerker yeah okay okay yeah uh-huh and jim uh the jim then wrote dream man uh-huh that was the follow-up to Batman's yeah. Benediction. Uh -huh. he, and then he wrote Queen of Angels. So really you were good friends English. with Jim? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And then, did that lead to stage? Yes. Uh -huh. One day, um, I can remember this as if it was yesterday, we were saying, well, uh, you know, there was so little money. And because, you know, this was before all the big celebrity benefits, and there, there was a reason to have to make money to go out there and raise money and people were doing it in small and big ways but mostly for small people ways. with AIDS for people with AIDS for whatever yeah really basically for direct services I think um, oh. or to give them money to you know. pay the rent exactly and, yeah. anything like that there was and no money take care of their pets so. yes all those things so mm -hmm. we came up with the idea of doing this sort of mm -hmm. talent show and and uh, with singers we thought that would be a good idea and I remember sitting at the Crest Coffee Shop, and we were trying to figure out what to call it. And we said, "Well, we can't, we can't use the word AIDS because we'll make this a, a benefit that we'll be able to go on and and cover other uh, issues or illnesses or, or causes, support support system, system mm -hmm. for other diseases or whatever may come, gay, straight, whatever." So we were we. Delicately sat there and had our piece of paper and we were writing all these. So we came up with Southland Good <coughs> Southland Theater Artist Goodwill Event. Oh. Southland Theater Artist Goodwill Event. That's so well. But that took us a little while and we sat there and did that, but we were so proud of ourselves. And I mean, what I think is so interesting about this story is, of course, it's never been for anything but AIDS. Right. But li we would never, ever, ever, ever have imagined when we were mm -hmm. sitting there. We thought AIDS would be over in two years. Oh, you did? Oh, mm -hmm. or th two or three years. Really? And yeah, this was 80... Oh, early, 83, This maybe. was like grid AIDS? A little bit after, after grid. After, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. and, but people didn't think it was going to go on forever. Oh, um, really? They would come up with a cure? Uh -huh. Oh, absolutely, in um, a few years. Oh, yeah. And that's what's, I think, significant about us naming that. Otherwise, we would have given it a name with the AIDS. word AIDS in it. I see. Uh -huh. So, um... Uh -huh. And uh, did Jim live in Silver Lake? He lived in Echo Park. Uh -huh. 
and then we rented a house in Glendale for I a see. while. And Cre the Crest Coffee Shop was uh, kind of a meetup place, right? The Crest Coffee Shop was the meetup mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. for actors, directors, writers, artists of all kinds, gay, poets. Gay. Yeah, gay, predominantly mm -hmm. gay men. But, you know, in the different light, <coughs> was down the street, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. virtually down mm -hmm. the street. So it was the same, you know, there was uh, a, a, a route, uh, artery, from mm -hmm. the crest to the different lights. So it was a lot of the same people after they'd work at the different light or whatever. You know, you'd see people with their bags from a different light in the crest. And did you ever uh, do readings at a different light? Or how did oh, you relate? Lots of readings. How did you relate to well, a different light? Jim worked at a different light mm -hmm. for a while. And he did a Sunday night, Mark will be better at this than I will, a Sunday night reading series, which oh. was became a book. What was that called? I think you're uh, in it. It was called A Different Light, I think. Was it? Well, and then, I, I, well there's one anthology called A Different Light. Oh, you're right. But I think Jim's was a different title. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Several anthologies came from this mm. reading series that Jim started. Other people mm. then t mm. it nurtured it and fostered it as well. Mm -hmm. But his was Gay Men. Uh, gay men, and of course, a lot of them had HIV. And this mm -hmm. was in this milieu. This was one of the first times that HIV and AIDS was discussed mm -hmm. by writers and poets in an open forum, mm -hmm. and especially where people with AIDS mm -hmm. ill got up and oh. did their work. Uh -huh. And did you um, help? direct any of that or I arrange it? I was involved it in it with Jim, because Jim was and I Jim. did several mm -hmm. readings there and um, you know everybody mm -hmm. came to these things yeah. Harry Hay and mm -hmm. you know all the grandfathers of mm -hmm. you know I mean everybody came other artists everyone was there playwrights mm -hmm. um, nice yeah. yeah they were all supportive of each other you know because it was like a month I think maybe it was weekly or monthly but it was just always alive, and it, you know, AIDS in that way. It's that this is that kind of Wizard of Oz aspect. It gave writers and poets and and artists of all stripes. It gave them <coughs> certainly. This is my story. Something to focus on. Yeah. Uh -huh. Where they may have been, mm -hmm. you know, focusing on identity. Mm -hmm. Like I focused a lot on identity, gay identity and, and homophobia. That that was getting tired a little. Like, uh -huh. okay, we've yeah. done that. We've talked about coming <laughs> out. Yeah. Coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out. There can't be enough coming out stories. Still today there can't. But for me, i sort of done that subject. But then comes this big, juicy issue that was so full of drama mm -hmm. and still is mm -hmm. that we all had things we could glom on to mm -hmm. whether we were positive or not i mean mm -hmm. there were so many men well again i think fear was probably rampant fear, in silver lake and a different light and stage and the kind of work and community you had help people help yourselves and absolutely. help people deal with the fear that was around but no mm -hmm. you i mean now that mm -hmm. you're saying that you mm -hmm. would see extreme levels of fear if someone walked in to say a different light mm -hmm. or to the crest mm -hmm. covered with lesions weighing 120 pounds mm -hmm. I mean that would elicit mm -hmm. among that group of people who were either positive or thinking they made zero convert or who had a lover who was positive or a best friend who was positive if they would see somebody in, in any an extremist mm -hmm. in any way I mean, I remember seeing somebody in there who had been, a, you know, like a leading person in, in my life in the theater and in, in film and television, and he was an agent, in fact, and he was in a different line, I'll never forget this, and he was clearly demented, mm -hmm. and people were kind of taking care of him, and I remember that he was like going into the... The, the, the closet, like the broom closet, thinking it was the bathroom. Yeah. It was just that moment was like, you talk about fear, just that moment. Mm -hmm. Because I think everybody was afraid of dementia, which yeah. doesn't happen too much now. Mm -hmm. But I think that was one of the greatest mm -hmm. fears, mm -hmm. was becoming demented. Yeah, sure. 
And, you know, in Silver Lake, did you feel like um, you saw people stepping up to care for other people? You know, like um, there was a, kind of a, a strong community, a caring, strong, caring community of maybe men and women that and came forward. And straight people, I think. Straight, right. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think there were a lot of straight comrades in Silver Lake, yeah. you being one of the main ones. But there were people who came around, and there's certainly, I think people did feel safer in Silver Lake than they did, for instance, in West Hollywood. Really? I think so. Oh, yeah. Because there was less looks at them, and, you know, already there was a, that certain acceptance of, you didn't have to be a muscle boy or you didn't have to be the prettiest person in the world and you could be a little scrappy and mm -hmm. all those things and you were accepted and you were hot i mean and, you, you know yeah. those guys were and cared for <laughs> and yeah, yeah and those guys also there was you know it's sort of silly to say there was more heart here but i think maybe there was more heart mm -hmm. in silver like at mm -hmm. the time but i do know that i mean i heard people actually say that they felt safer in Silver Lake. That that when they went out of the mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. you know, to grocery stores or places, they did not feel as safe. Mm -hmm. Because in those days, people didn't feel safe. They were stared at and... It was stigma. It was, there huge. was a stigma. Yeah. It was a big stigma. And mm -hmm. I'm sure it was a stigma in some places in mm -hmm. Silver Lake, but I think less so mm -hmm. maybe than anywhere in the early days. Mm -hmm. So you met Philip along the way here? Along the way, and then we went became um, lovers, and I traveled all over the place with him, with him. he was a big traveler. Right. You went and to Paris? And Paris, and Egypt, Egypt and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Amsterdam. And, and where was your career at during that time? Well, my career we had really, um, I'd done intimacies then. So th that's 25 years ago, so I had done intimacies, and I felt like my career was, I felt kind of like, okay, I can travel. I, I, I've, I've, because? I'm, not, I'm not obsessed with my career uh, as much as I had been. Because? I felt like I'd done, I mean, I'd achieved been, a lot of success uh, uh -huh. and a lot of, you know, I, I had toured, before I met Philip, I had toured a lot. So I was on the last legs of touring because I was also getting to be 40, which of course then seemed old and now it doesn't seem <laughs> Oh, so to be 40 old. again. <laughs> now it seems like a child. But then it seemed like I toured and I was tired, mm -hmm. you know, and I wanted to focus on a relationship, mm -hmm. which I did. And then I started touring again. But yeah, I did. I did. Oh. So I, then I started touring again oh. after about a year or so of the relationship, which was then horrible because he got sick, mm. and then I was on tour, and then I was calling every night, and then blah, 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 and then finally I said, that, you know, then I went back, and, you know, I had dates in various cities, I said, that's it, I'm not, I'm, they're all canceled, mm. I'm uh -huh. staying with them. You're going to go back. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then I left, like, uh -huh. well, I left in dramatic circumstances, he had, like, a seizure, and I, mm -hmm. I had a show that night, mm -hmm. I think. I had a and show he never night. really recovered from the. He never really recovered mm -hmm. from that seizure. Mm -hmm. He ostensibly, he thought he recovered, but he never really recovered mm -hmm. from that mm -hmm. seizure. So I went back that day. Mm -hmm. That I got there that night, and then mm -hmm. I stayed nearby. And uh, the nature of that relationship, was, I think I remember from your book, you kind of considered yourselves married. Yeah, we considered ourselves married. Yeah. We had a wedding and rings and. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean it was. It was certainly the most mature relationship mm -hmm. that I had. Really? Do yeah. you think you and were just had ready? Heat and it had um, an intellectual component. <clears throat> he was very smart. I mean, I think in many ways it was our differences. You know, we were ostensibly uh, very different people. Mm -hmm. You know, he was very contained and quiet. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like he was like that about me a little. Mm -hmm. I mean, and also, you know, when, when I started appearing on television, 
that was when I came out on TV about being HIV positive. But I called him. Mm -hmm. I was on the road when that happened. And well, actually, well, you yeah, did is, come out publicly. Um, well, here's how it happened. Okay. I mean, this was a really great story. I mean, a sad story. Okay, Brad Davis died six years after Rock Hudson. Brad Davis died in a state of utter shame, fear, anxiety, depression, anger, all the things that we worked for six years to try to amend with gay men or any man or any woman mm -hmm. or any human being dying of AIDS. Brad Davis, for the record, was in Midnight Express, Corel. Um, the normal heart, ironically. So when Brad Davis died, it was like, oh, well, who are we going to talk to about this? So you know how the media is. Well, well, oh, there's that gay actor. He talked about Hudson when he died. Well, well, he'll, he'll talk, won't he? That's how they think. You know, they have some index card that says gay actor. So they come to me, and there were three networks were doing shows on him the next morning, mm. ABC, NBC, CBS, they were all doing shows, and they all contacted me. Mm. I said, I had later joked, it was the only time three networks were after me. And I talked to all of them, and they all had various um, ways of approaching the subject, and they all knew that the each, you know, it was, I was only going to do one show. Mm. Mm. And um, one of them said at this show called The Faith Daniels Show, which was a big NBC show that was on at uh, like 11 in the morning. And they said, you know, um, if you happen to be HIV positive and you wanted to talk about that, we would handle it very delicately. And I said, well, what does that mean? Yeah, <laughs> right. They said, well, we would, um, we would just be gentle and, and, and supportive of your decision. Blah, blah, blah. So I thought, okay, well, yeah, they've sort of figured it out by just their imagination. I called Morris Kite. Now, Morris Kite, I had said to Morris Kite, somewhere in the, from the time I'd been tested to this time, I'd had a conversation with him, and I said, I feel a bit like I'm deceiving people. Because I'm doing all these things for AIDS and HIV, I know I'm positive, and I'm not telling people. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm lying. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, oh, no, 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 dear. Wait, wait, wait until the perfect moment comes, mm -hmm. and it will come. So I called him, and I got him on the <laughs> phone. I'm in Washington, D.C. And he said, yes, that's, this is the moment <laughs> you've waited for. So you've got to do it and do it in a big way. Mm -hmm. So then, of course, there's Philip's parents who don't know he's HIV positive. Mm -hmm. So, of course, when they hear me on TV, if they do, they're going to find out I'm HIV positive, and they're going to assume he's HIV positive, right? That's going to be the trajectory of that, likely. But So we had to cover those bases. So I had to call Philip, and I said, I have this opportunity to do a national television show. Now, no one knew that this was going to mushroom after I did this one appearance. So I go on the show, I'm on with Brad Davis's widow, and um, at some point, very early on, I, I in the interview, and I, I, the host did not know I was going to say it necessarily. Really? No, I mean, I think she was prepared that I might, but I didn't tell them I was going to in advance. But they knew, I knew that I would be supported, is what they said, so I trusted them. Hmm. And I was. So I said, um, you know, I, I just feel that there's something that I need to say, and uh, that is that I'm HIV positive. And she, which was, of course, they're never supposed to do, ever, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she reached and touched my knee mm -hmm. and sort of had tears. Mm -hmm. So this was a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. And they're in, I know, they're in the press room when I go out, and the LA Times is there, and the New York Times. So this was like a big deal that an actor had HIV and admitted mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And I was doing this show, I was doing intimacies at a theater. Mm -hmm. 
So then the next day was Entertainment Tonight, blah, 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 blah. So it went on and on and on. Mm -hmm. But Morris mm -hmm. was right. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, there's the guilt about, oh, I'm, you know, and of course this was leveled at me, I think, at various times, you know, that I'm using it. Oh right, I'm using it so, to, so that so that I'll never get another I'd rather TV not. job. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'd rather li live a normal or whatever that is life, yeah, an yeah. unperturbed mm -hmm. by HIV life. Well, you must so, have felt some kind of responsibility, actually. Well, for... then I really mm -hmm. felt responsibility, yeah. mm -hmm. huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, of course, you get weary of being the HIV. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. the only poster child but. or poster boy. There were plenty mm -hmm. to share that, you know, Palm and Nat. And, and then, of course, there was, at some point, as this wore on, we would talk to each other oh. and say, do we have to quell some of this excitement about being, coming writers and becoming artists and and our work blossoming and blah, 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 because there's people out there who might look at that and want to become HIV yeah. positive. Mm -hmm. So there was that, mm -hmm. like, well, oh I'll, oh, I'll become HIV positive, I'll become a poet and I'll have my picture in the paper. That was a fear. Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. We, those of us who were the poster boys for HIV, talked about uh -huh. and said we got to be very careful. Okay. in our, that this is a disease, mm -hmm. and it's a disease that will kill you possibly, and you, especially then, and you, um, you can be an artist, and a gay artist, without being an HIV positive mm -hmm. artist, mm -hmm. and you can get in the paper, and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, get accolades without being positive, mm -hmm. so that was another interesting aspect that I don't think people talk about much, mm -hmm. well, so many of those guys are dead, and, really, and there's still people who, well, I know for a long time there were people who had survivor guilt or being negative guilt and wanted to become... I have survivor <laughs> guilt. You know, I have uh -huh. survivor guilt. And what, how would you articulate it? When something good happens to me. No, oh, really? Uh-huh. A uh -huh. lot of it. Uh, and a lot of it's, uh, a lot of it's just probably, I think we all carry guilt for some reason or another. I have something to to find mm -hmm. mine mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when I look at that kid that I had 19 years mm -hmm. of raising a child, mm -hmm. and then I think of all these men who were children when they died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were, some of them were not that much older than she is now. Right. Some of them were 25, 26. Younger. You know, that's seven years older, eight years older than she is. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk then about uh, wanting to become a father, because there was a little history before Tia came along. Right? Yes, there was. I, yeah. I well. Okay, so what, Philip died. Philip died, mm -hmm. and then and came um, out on television. Came out on television. Philip died. I uh, inherited a little bit of money from Philip, uh, and I wanted to do something with my life different and I thought of okay he died how long do I have to live uh, what am I going to do with that time left I've had a strong relationship I've had a strong career um, what have I not had that I really 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 want and that was to be a father well you can only imagine what the response to that was um, the pub, the well, the there was the my friend's response. <laughs> there was uh, Your mom? the doctor's response. Mm -hmm. My mother's response. Um, the adoption agency. The so. adoption <laughs> agency's responses. Uh, my, you know, my response to myself having to lie on paperwork and all that. Um, you know, but you know, the, truthfully, I guess other than my mother. There was no woman, gay or straight, who ever deterred me. Not one woman. Not one mm -hmm. woman ever said, oh, this is crazy. Oh, you're nuts. Oh, there's something wrong with you. Oh. Gay men? Oh, my. <laughs> really? 
Oh, it was written in the press. The most in, horrible things. You in what, what were some of the responses? What were some of the responses? Some okay. of them. How will he ever get out of the sex clubs long enough to take care of a baby? Mm. That was one mm. sweet one. <laughs> I had just done... Uh, these stay with you, by the way. Mm. I had just done Camille, Robert Ludlum... Robert... Charles. Ro Charles Ludlum's... <laughs> Robert Chesley Charles. Charles Ludlum's Camille. I had just done that. And somebody said... Oh, Camille's going to have a baby. Mm. So just like really mean stuff. Mm. Stuff that was so mean that um, the people, my friends, you know, were shocked mm. that the paper would print them. Oh. So they did. So anyway, that kind of, my response to things where people are saying hateful and negative things it just makes me stronger mm. it makes me more defiant <laughs> more defiant uh, i guess mm -hmm. i'm mm -hmm. i guess defiant is a word you'd use mm -hmm. so anyway yes i had some foster well okay here's what everybody said well i had you know everyone also thinks that i like one day woke up and said oh i'm gonna adopt a child and went out and got Catherine. Mm -hmm. well hello no i went through a lot of decision making over well over a year and, you know, first I decided, okay, well, maybe I'll just be a <coughs> weekend sort of a dad who, or a, you know, a substitute dad for somebody who needs a male figure. I went to see people. I saw a couple of lesbians I remember down at the beach. I met with them. I talked to them. I thought, you know what? It, it's not what they wanted at the end of the day, and it wasn't what I wanted. And then somebody said, well, maybe you should foster. And I said, yeah, well, that... Maybe that's a good idea to get my feet wet and see. So I did temporary foster. Then there was all this stuff about me being HIV positive that came out, went back in the closet, came back out. So there, I don't want to get into all that. But let us let us say that it was all complicated. And it was all testing my resolve. durability yeah. uh -huh. and my resolve. Mm -hmm. Testing my resolve uh -huh. more than anything. Because at every turn I said to myself, am I doing the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. Every time something seemed like it wasn't working out, mm. it was that old, oh, this is karma, this is a signal, this mm -hmm. is blah, blah, blah. But my defiance won out every mm. time because every time it made me want a baby more mm. instead of less. Yeah, you were clearer. Uh -huh. I, was n I got clearer. Mm -hmm. I got clearer with each experience. Yeah. So then I had a baby for, I had a baby baby, like really a baby, um, for four months, then I had, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, for a week, about a week. It was supposed to be a weekend to turn into a week or a couple weeks. And then I had two boys mm -hmm. for four months. Mm -hmm. Now, if anything is going to let you know if you want to be a father or not. And these were damaged little yeah. munchkins. Mm -hmm. One more than the other. How but, old? Um, they were toddlers. Three and five. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the five-year-old was starting kindergarten, uh -huh. and the three-year-old was with me all day. And, the, and all night would not leave me. He was like up uh -huh. against my leg. Uh -huh. So that was painful, difficult. I really liked their father, which was another, that was a whole other thing, like how could I like this guy? But I did, and I thought he was a good man, ultimately. And Eventually, the mother got them back, which I wasn't sure was the best thing in the world. But I was never, ever set to be their parent. And then it became more and more clear to me that I wanted a baby from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because, and I tell men today who come to me and a lot do about adopting, I say, get a baby, get a baby, mm -hmm. get a baby. Unless you want to go through that process of sort of retraining and trying to deal with a lot of stuff that's the, formed. The baggage that comes along Huge with Huge baggage. Catherine had baggage in five months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She just had the baggage of having been born predisposed to crack and an um, incubator for a month and, and um, yeah, look mm -hmm. at her, okay. incubator a month and then uh, not very good foster care for four months. Mm -hmm. We had to work at that five months, which what I would call damage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Susie North knows. And uh, tell me how it came, tell us how it came about that you got the call about Catherine? Well, I got <clears throat> the 
call. Um, Wait, I think I think we need to explain just because it's gone back and forth that she was Tia at the beginning. She was Tia, and at the who beginning. was Tia, and then became Catherine. Yeah, that's just, a story in and of itself. Uh, okay, which all is right. A great so story. just so we'll for tell that one, the sake of the interview, Tia, Tia is Catherine. Her Catherine mother was named her Tia and uh, left the hospital. Okay. So you got a call about Tia. I got a call about Tia that there was, you know, I had no um, restrictions in terms of uh, what child, kind of child I wanted. Oh. It could have been male, because it was female, black, Asian, Asian, mixed race, or physically ill. Hmm. I would have taken the baby with AIDS. So I had absolutely no, nothing, I had checked nothing that I didn't want. So they called them, they said, we have a five month old baby that was, a, you know, they have to tell you everything, it's African American, that was addicted to crack. She appears to not have any residual problems at this moment. But there was the, no the mother was addicted to crack, which meant the baby was addicted the baby's to addicted. Well, that's what they say. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, she, she, she certainly had problems breathing because she, she was in an incubator for a month. Mm. So she... And she was premature, wasn't she? She, she was born at like seven months gestation, weighed about two pounds. Right, right. No prenatal care. Right. So her entry into the world was not what you'd call ideal. Mm. And I knew all this, you know. It, it, so when I got her, at, I got her at f five months. She was the size of a three-month-old mm. baby. No, wait. I got her at yes. I got her at five months, right. and she was a, she was teensy, you know, mm -hmm. very five. Mm -hmm. So at that point, there were no guarantees with this baby, as there are no guarantees with any baby mm -hmm. that's born right here in the Los Feliz Hills. There's no guarantee with any baby that mm. you know. What we there's Down syndrome, there's autism, there's a million different things. So I get the call, and I have like twelve hours or something. I don't know, not many hours, and um, I had to get stuff. You know, I had to get. Mm -hmm. But now I had done, I had already had a baby, baby. So mm -hmm. I wasn't afraid of a baby. I wasn't afraid of diapers changing, and I wasn't afraid of all those all night stuff and all that. I was. I had gotten my hands mm -hmm. into that, so I knew what I was getting pretty much. And I was going to visit my mother, who was supposedly going to stop drinking. That's a whole other story. But I I do remember the day that they had to bring her to me, and you know they're just bringing us in a little car baby seat, seat yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and that's all. I have to get, I have everything else, you know, mm -hmm. clothes, toys, diapers, food, the right milk, you know, the right, I had to get the right formula, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And she had to have a special formula, I think, because of whatever. So anyway, suddenly um, I, I'm in the house in Glendale, and I remember they were, um, there was an, a little uh, tarmacking or whatever the word is, the street. Oh. And so we had to sort of walk over the neighbor's yard, and I think that was so. I thought that was just sort of an interesting thing mm. that to get her, I had to like do this <laughs> circuitous little walk wow. to the person who had this baby. Oh. Oh. And you were by yourself. Yeah, I was by myself. Wow. I wanted to be by myself. You did. I did. Oh. At first, I wanted to be by myself. Later, did? lots of people came. Uh -huh. You know, no, I didn't wear lots at once, but I, that's not true. Probably a lot of people came that night mm -hmm. or that yeah. afternoon and yeah. that evening. Right. But at first, I wanted to be with her alone. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get her feel uh -huh. for it all. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, I, she was blank. That was the thing. She was pretty... Emotionless. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, she hadn't had much stimulation. It mm -hmm. was clear. The back of her head, you know, this happens to a lot of babies, but hers was severe from doing this. And the mm -hmm. rubbed off all of her hair. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All of them. Yeah. Now a lot of babies have it where they're thin. It's yeah. thin. Uh -huh. But that showed if a baby has that, they're not being washed or, or lift, carried, and or carried or hugged. And, yeah. So that was. And pretty, were they telling you this was a foster adopt or? A it was a foster to adopt. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that's when, of course, a lot of the HIV started to get serious because... The um, HIV issues, so the not HIV your health. Issue. Right. No, my health was great. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, my health was never great, had never been greater, uh, in fact. So um, one day, you know, they tested her constantly for uh, any kind of reaction to the crack. You know, the, the county would mm -hmm. come and she'd have to do um, physical things and um, developmental. Mental, deve yeah. developmental things mm -hmm. and her height and her weight and all those things. Well, by a year, she was ahead of the chart. Mm -hmm. She was ahead. In, she definitely caught up. In, she caught up and in surpassed went ahead. Mm -hmm. in a right. year. So good dad. <laughs> that was good that she was eating, mm -hmm. she was healthy, she knew how to play, she knew how to put mm -hmm. things together, all those things. Thank God, that was really great. So then we got, you know, in those days, it took three years to adopt, mm -hmm. approximately. Mm -hmm. I know. So every day you think, they're going to take her. Mm -hmm. They can come and take her mm -hmm. for any reason mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So one day, the social worker is sitting right here, and she uh, says to me, she sort of a cat lady, and she wore cat lady clothes. And <laughs> she dressed in purple. She was a character. I mean, we're just a great character, you know. And she liked you. And she liked me. Mm -hmm. And so one day, I'm sitting there, and she's there, Catherine's taking a nap. And she said, you know, if I had a client who had a heart condition, I certainly wouldn't keep them from adopting. And I thought, where is this oh, going? Yeah. Uh -huh. And then she said, and if I had a client who was HIV positive, I wouldn't keep them from adopting. Mm. Is this a trap? <laughs> so I thought, well, I thought, is this a trap or, or can I trust her? I can trust her. I really believe I can trust her. So she said, are you a child? And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. And so she said, well, there's a pause, a slight pause, and she's not writing anything. She said, well, I just wanted to know in case it comes up that I can protect you. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so like, this was some angel yeah. set. Yeah. Really, she's you know, on I, your team. <laughs> she was on my team. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know to this day. She could have been a lesbian. She could not. She could have heard. She could anything. I mean, she could have just surmised. She was smart. You know, she could have just surmised. Well, what's the chances? There's a good chance he's HIV positive. So anyway, blah 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 blah. Wait. Then, and also, I think she knew how difficult it would be to uh, for anybody to adopt Catherine with her scenario, right? So she wanted Catherine. To, ha to be loved, and you loved her, and to be in a good home. And this was she kind did. of like the perfect situation. So she wanted to support it. Probably. She did want to support it. Yeah. There was no question about that. And also, here's another just political comment mm -hmm. to make. You know, gays and lesbians at that time, this is a law, this is history in terms of gays and lesbians. What year, what year would you say this was? Well, well I, 80, 94, mm -hmm. 95 when I got her. She was born in 94. I got her in 95. Gays and lesbians were given the outcast children only. Uh -huh. Right. A gay to and lesbian person mm -hmm. could not adopt a blonde, blue-eyed, white child. Mm -hmm. Impossible. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. give me all the outcasts in the world. <laughs> I'll be fine with that. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh -huh. So, I mean, I, I could care less then. Mm -hmm. Of about that, but some people, even mm -hmm. gays and lesbians, <laughs> wanted that white, mm -hmm. blue baby. eyed baby. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that wasn't going to happen in those days. It mm -hmm. probably much more likely mm -hmm. happens now. But kind of from the beginning, along these three years, uh, you really bonded with with Catherine and felt like this was right. For no, you. there was no question. Yeah. But, and then there was all the family stuff, you know. Then the Your, family, her family, her family, right? They decided they wanted her, and Miss Miss Coleman, or? Miss yeah, that was uh, not even a blood relative. Uh -huh. Decided she wanted her, and of course, I've been since told by another family member simply for the monthly check. For the check, right? Yeah, you said money was an issue. There were other people sort of vying for her, vying for her because for four hundred and something dollars a month, month right? Right. So you had to have the social worker on your side. I had to have and the your doctor on your and side. Her doc I had every I had a team that was uh -huh. and eventually the lawyer. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Who was like, Are you 
are you joking that you're going to take this baby away from this man? Mm -hmm. And he was a straight guy. Wow. That's... And he was like, come mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy has taken her to school. You know, on the stand, I said, you know, I, I have fed her. I've taken her to school. I've clothed her. I, you know, I've done everything any two parents could have done. <laughs> so, I, I it ultimately, I won every Prevail, battle, yeah. but there mm. were many, I mean, there were many ridiculous mm. uh, a court ho house appearances mm. where this woman would instigate something out of the blue and she'd mm. get a court hearing mm -hmm. and I'd have to go and show up and fight. Mm -hmm. and some of them test. were thrown out, they, they were just ridiculous. Eventually they said, you know, they kept trying to name a father because if they could name a father, mm -hmm. they could then get the father mm -hmm. To keep me from having the baby, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the judge eventually was—he laughed out loud and said, <laughs> "Do not bring me the name of one more potential father." Yeah, good. They didn't know who the father was. Yeah, they didn't have a clue. Right, but again, all that time you must have been very fearful of losing. Fearful her. until the night before it actually happened. Uh, adopting her. Yeah, basically. and then exactly. the fear remains. You don't get over fear. When, yeah. It's like fear of dying or fear mm. of, you know, it's like AIDS. It's like mm. mourning those mm. people who die. People think, well, your mourning period is over. No, it's not. Mm. And I'm not fearful now, of course, that anybody's going to yeah. take her from me. But the <laughs> first few years, mm. I certainly still was worried that someone would knock on the mm. door because mm. it was it was so scary mm -hmm. for periods of time when the court appearances were happening and when there was no verdict being given and I'm taking care of her and I'm thinking they're going to come get her, they're going to come take her away from me. And then who knew what was going to happen that final day in the courtroom? Wow. No one knew what the, the mm -hmm. judge was going to say. He was a judge that was very well known mm -hmm. for putting families back together. Mm -hmm. That was sort of his his posture, thing, yeah. his posture mm -hmm. that, and people knew that, mm -hmm. that scared me. Mm -hmm. It was his last day at work, mm -hmm. so you thought, oh, well, he could go out with a bang mm -hmm. by reuniting this family. Mm -hmm. He was, he, mm -hmm. there was no question in his mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> as a parent, though, you were living one day at a time. Uh, Still and, am. <laughs> and really enjoying it. <laughs> Yeah, I it mean, was, it, she, you know, she's a great, she, I all, I never ever, as you know, I mean, I never for one moment doubted her potential. Uh -huh. I never ever um, thought that she was anything other than a very, very smart, complicated human being. Uh -huh. And I still think that. Uh -huh. And and she, all of her rough edges have been smoothed away. Uh -huh. And she had some rough edges. Mm -hmm. However, you know, this is not, you know, in spite of all the care and the comfort and the people and the love and the support financially, emotionally, all this combined does not take away the fact that she was abandoned by her mother. Mm -hmm. And this is coming up now mm -hmm. as I knew it would. Mm -hmm. event. I knew it would come up. And now she has another road to travel to deal with that. Uh, I do remember you telling me, and, and also it's in the book, that you had visits with her biological mother and her step-siblings. Uh, and she, uh, did, was it there that she asked, or you kind of initiated that yourself? Or? I, I over-initiated mm -hmm. it, if anything. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I didn't say you have to do this, mm -hmm. but I said, I just think it's important that we remain open. Mm -hmm. Now, when she got in her teen years, I, uh, I let her make the decisions, mm -hmm. and she did not want to go anymore. And she, I don't know, I think that that could change, you know, but the mother, only in the 21st century, wanted her to be her Facebook friend. Mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. Well, that sent her reeling. Catherine, mm -hmm. and then asked her again. Mm -hmm. That's when she changed her name, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Why didn't you explain that? Well, you know, she, this name had hung on to her, and she never liked the name. Tia. Because, Tia, mm -hmm. because it was given to her by her mother. So mm -hmm. she, she didn't like the name. And her middle name was Catherine, named after my grandmother, who was 
You know how every gay kid has like a savior? <laughs> I mean, it's either a grandmother or a neighbor or an aunt or someone. It's usually not the parents. Mm -hmm. who, but it's some other figure that loves them unconditionally and lets them be who they are. Well, that was my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so Catherine's middle name was Catherine. And, and I talked about my grandmother to her relentlessly because I had so many fun stories. Mm -hmm. and, you know, when I talk about my family, the positive part of my family was my grandmother. And I told her the good and bad and ugly about all the family. But I would also, the antidote to all the horror was the grandmother, Catherine. Mm -hmm. So when she decided to change her name, there was no question her name would be Catherine mm -hmm. after my okay. grandmother. And um, that is, that's one of the most telling things about who she is, I think. That she, you know, respected my choices to that as a middle name. Mm -hmm. She could have named herself anything mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. But she respected my family and her mm -hmm. fa it made her, it her family. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just think that her choosing that name was a mm -hmm. big, mm -hmm. big mm -hmm. deal. And um, uh, you haven't really sort of caught us up about your brother, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> but I know Catherine, you took Catherine to visit your brother so I think you need to fill us in a little bit. He committed yeah, it. It's the most, well, it's pretty painful stuff, mm -hmm. but it is, again, a testament to who she is mm -hmm. and who he has become in large part due to who she is. I mean, mm -hmm. he, my brother's in prison for murder. I don't want to need to go into all the details. Um, you know, it's a complicated issue. It's okay. And I never lied to her mm -hmm. about anything. So at some point I told her. And at some point uh, I said, you can visit. And at first she was reticent. And then the first time we went, she hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed. And a friend took me and was on the parking lot. And it's like a scene in the movie, you know, where I'm in line to go and she's mm. out in the car and I'm getting closer and closer and then all of a sudden she runs up. She decides she wants to go. She wants to meet him. <laughs> she wants to meet him. Mm -hmm. So now we've been, um, and his response to her and her response to him was so immediate and, you know, Real. I was, <laughs> yeah, and I'd say he had some racism in his life and this was so much of a healing for him oh. in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And then, now, you know, he calls her on the phone. Mm -hmm. oh. When he gets, you know, he, he gets time to talk to her on the phone. He has his own mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. with her, which she has worked at and he has worked at. Mm -hmm. She completely loves him. Mm -hmm. Now we've visited several times. Mm -hmm. and she is at ease. She's studied the facts about the, mm -hmm. the instance. Uh, you know, at first I didn't tell her what that. I don't. I wanted to. I don't want to sound like. Oh, I tell her everything. I did not tell her what he was in for oh. for a long time. Mm -hmm. I she waited. Was pretty little, then. She was pretty young when I mm -hmm. first told her. Mm -hmm. I did not say why. I said he did something bad. Mm -hmm. And then as she got older, I think she started saying, "Well, what what what, what bad, bad did he do?" <laughs> and she was old enough. When, when mm -hmm. they're old enough to ask the question in a in a smart way, mm -hmm. you answer it. Mm -hmm. So that is also one of my, mm -hmm. you know, aside from my, that, that sort of public persona and all that nonsense, there's this, which is that, that it's made me much closer to him, that it's made her feel close to someone that it's, I think it's actually, if someone's life can be changed, I think she's changed his mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really do. Mm -hmm. And you know, mm -hmm. even the cards and the phone calls, they're intermittent, but they're big, they're important. Mm -hmm. So that's thats a real mm -hmm. force in life. Yeah, yeah, well. I, I guess I also wanted to talk about your trip with Catherine to South Africa, to the AIDS orphanage. Yeah, and um, I'm going to Africa again 
in the next month. Oh, you, you are? To... I'm going to do, I'm oh. working with, um, a, a, somebody I worked with in the theater has a school there that he started. He oh. is uh, a film and TV guy, and I directed a play that he was producing. And uh, he has a school in Kenya that he started. Oh. And I said, well, can I come to Kenya and do something? So I'm going to go there for you a mean, couple like of weeks. You like teaching... Drama? I'm going to teach, well, more telling their stories, oh. but in a, in a little more complex way than they're used to telling their stories. You know, they're very, the kids in Africa are so shut down about their parents, mm -hmm. about HIV. Mm -hmm. It's just not spoken about. It's mm -hmm. as if it's not, right. it's as if it's it real doesn't taboo. exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. The fact that they're orphans, it's not, it's as if it doesn't exist. Because mm -hmm. it's so widespread, mm -hmm. everybody's an orphan, mm -hmm. everybody's parents died of AIDS. Everybody has been abandoned, but so nobody talks about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to talk about it, mm -hmm. about it. Well, and, a little. Uh, and film it or just? He, oh yeah, he'll film uh -huh. a lot of it and will uh, maybe create a paradigm that could then be repeated. I could go back because mm -hmm. it's a lot of the same kids. He mm -hmm. has kids from uh, in high school level from like 12 to in their early 20s because mm -hmm. some of them didn't start high school till they were yeah. 18 or 19. Okay. Well, what about your trip? With so our Africa? trip to South Africa, she was only, I was so bad at the years, but she was pretty young, uh, 13 maybe, 12 or 13? Mm, I didn't think it was that long ago, but maybe. maybe. 14, it was a while ago. She mm. was pretty young, she's 19 now, I think it was at least five years ago. Okay. In any case, she was young to take something like this on, I think. Well, explain how... Um, well, we what? went to South Africa, in a situation where we we went to work at an orphanage, and we did not know what that or what that work would entail, an orphanage for AIDS babies. And did someone invite you? Or? No, we paid. You know, mm -hmm. you what you do is you pay for your. You room heard room about the orphanage. I heard about several, and I went with a friend, Molly Lowry, who kind of knows the social services arena. So you initiated it. You wanted to go. Oh, absolutely. And you wanted, wanted to, to take go. Catherine. I absolutely wanted to go, and I absolutely wanted her to um, be exposed mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. So we talked about it a lot, and she, you know, she was very responsive. I think she was scared a little. But, you know, here's the story. We got off the um, plane... 17 hours and we got off the plane and we went to the house where we'd be staying it was a very nice flat and all the HIV kids were on the first floor and we were on the second floor and we got there and they were going ice skating and she went like that she was with them. she went that day that at that time I was like on the yeah bed. <laughs> right. and, Jet she's, lag, right? and I'm hearing these kids <laughs> laughing and of mm. course they're they love anyone who's sure. different mm -hmm. and they of course she's black so she's different but she's not different mm -hmm. so they're asking her a million questions right. and on her just on her hugging her and mm -hmm. so she fell in love with them but then she really took to those babies and she mm -hmm. you know she knew every name of every baby mm -hmm. and she uh, you know, we were supposed to do various tasks, but they pretty much always let her take care of the mm -hmm. babies, and she changed the baby's yeah. diapers, and mm -hmm. she'd calm them down, and uh, she would go then on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And we only were really supposed to work five hours, five days a week, mm -hmm. about four or five hours a day, and she would go on the weekend because she missed the babies, and mm -hmm. she'd mm -hmm. spend time with mm -hmm. them. She took beautiful photos of them. And did she articulate or want to talk to you at all about... How she felt about those babies having AIDS and maybe dying, or uh, no, I don't or th them about. not having parents. Mm -hmm. She certainly has talked about it since. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think it was all, you know, she's not as like, she's not as emotional as I am. Mm -hmm. You know, she's more in her. She's a intellectual. She's she's it's in her brain. In her head more. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, she's emotional, uh -huh. but she's also very thoughtful, and she uh -huh. doesn't, she takes time to process uh -huh. Uh -huh. and to say things, you know, but her, I could see it in her behavior, you know, I didn't have to say it. I mean, we certainly talked about AIDS, and, and we certainly talked about, you know, some of the kids were, like, really, really, really in 
bad shape. And some of the babies were really in, in horrible, 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 horrible shape. Things that you never want anyone to see. And then I'd be guilty sometimes, like, am I exposing her to too much? Blah, blah, blah. But she... Mm -hmm. She never felt that ever, mm -hmm. ever. And to this day, she would not say mm -hmm. that. She just wants to go back. Mm -hmm. you know, she wants to go to another yeah. place like that. So mm -hmm. it instilled in her. I mean, I'm not saying this This can't be instilled within a child that doesn't want it instilled. Right. right. So I didn't make that. Mm -hmm. I, I. You followed her shepherd. lead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she mm -hmm. wanted mm -hmm. to be exposed to those things. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really um, feel like you two are an amazing team, and somehow you were really just placed together. I don't think there's any question. And you've grown from her, she's grown from you, you're really, you know, you're not her buddy, you're her parent. I'm not her buddy. Yeah. That we but, have to avoid that. When we're, but, uh, when the buddy thing happens, we fight. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. It's just not uh -huh. the, be the best way to be with your kid. And what, <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about her today, where she oh, is, okay. what she's she in does. London. Wait, I, I, I'm sorry. I just okay. want to say um, you sent her to some really good schools along the yes. way. Some that really kind of supported her maybe going uh, into acting, uh, her creativity. But for high school, she ended ended up at a boarding school where she became a filmmaker. She became a filmmaker and in high school. Could you talk a little bit about that film and then go to where she is? Okay, yeah. She made a film called A Family Like Mine, which I, you know, everybody thought, oh, well, like I had something to do with it. I had nothing to do that I did not know what the film was going to be about until I went to the, I assumed a family like mine, I knew the title, I knew she would interviewed me, but she didn't talk, here's an example, she didn't talk to me about the film, she didn't really say what the theme was or anything like that, she it was just sort she of, she was away at boarding school, she was away, she yeah. was at boarding school for two years, you know, I mean close by, thank God, much closer than she is now. And so I go to see the screening of this film, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, sobbing. Mm -hmm. And you know, the audience is standing and carrying mm -hmm. on. And, and then the film got a little heat, you know, did some film festivals, it's on KCT, and KCT purchased it for three years for Gay Pride Week. Mm -hmm. So um, now, how this has affected her in the long run, I don't. I think there are negatives as well as positives. Well, you know, to have all that heat when you're, oh. she was 18, uh -huh. 17, 18, uh -huh. and to be written about and interviewed, and it, was, a film pretty, purchase, like it was pretty heady uh -huh. stuff. Uh -huh. She handled it beautifully, uh -huh. but it brought up stuff. It ineluctably brought up stuff. Like, why is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why, how was I able to do that? Mm -hmm. And who am I? Mm -hmm. Who am I? Who am I? The stuff of any, making a film and having an artistic success doesn't eliminate the fact that she's a teenager. Right, right. And going through all the things that teenage girls go through. So, so but she decided to go to university. She decided to go to university in England, which I think has a lot to do with a lot of things. Including, and I think it was wise, to get away from Hollywood for a while. And it's because a film school. It's a film school. Mm -hmm. She's studying film production. Mm -hmm. Now, whether she's going to stay there beyond the first year, I don't know and I don't care. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. this is the way things are. Kids <laughs> move around and go to different schools mm -hmm. these days mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. regularly. She's, she likes it one day, doesn't like it the next. Mm -hmm. The same as any, I think, you know, I think she's well uh, <laughs> on the on the same wavelength of most college kids. Yeah. But she's, here's what she's learning. She's learning to live by herself, which is very incredibly important. Mm -hmm. She's making friends in a way that she didn't hear, I think. Um, she's getting a lot of boy attention, mm -hmm. which I think is good. Mm -hmm. And she's learning about the culture of living in another country at 19 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. what? Whether she learns anything yeah, yeah. in film school, who cares? I mean, she's she's taking it all in. Yeah. yeah. She's meeting kids from all over the world yeah. who will be filmmakers, yeah. and and you know, so it's an incredible experience for her. And um, and how do you feel with her being gone and moving on to college? It's been you know very difficult. I mean, I'm glad that I, in a way, I'm glad that I had the two years of Idlewild to kind of. 
hair. A transition. Kind of because way. there would be a month where I hadn't seen her, and then maybe six weeks. But this period we're in right now is going to be the longest. Mm -hmm. This is a six month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And last night I was thinking, well, is there any way that I can go? You know, I think for both of us it's probably good. I mean, this separation is inevitable. Mm -hmm. I mean, she will get married. Sure. And Oh no. <laughs> I, I mean, I hope, or she'll have a partner, or whatever. But, and, and you know, I'm not going to live forever. So we, I think these are, are yeah. stages, parents stages go that through. one <laughs> has to go through. You yeah. have to go through mm -hmm. them. And uh, I think, you know, we maybe have to kind of That's okay. That's pull good. this together a little bit. So, you know, you kind of, um, your career changed a bit. Uh, being a parent, I guess, you still lot, engaged yeah. in things and traveled and had other people take care of Catherine and all. And I took um, her with me a lot. And you took her with you. Uh, you wrote a book, you did a one-man show about your life. Now you're going to Africa. Also, you're the um, creative director of a theater. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk about your career at this point? Yeah, with a little. Catherine I mean, having I'm, grown up I'm, and, I'm less involved mm -hmm. with that theater right now. I'm involved in the Incubator, which is a new playwright's arm of that theater. What's the theater? Uh, Skylight Theater Company. Right. And then I'm also, uh, even kind of takes more of my time, is Queerwise, which is uh, GLBT seniors who write. And that's been going on about two years, and it's become quite a force. They've appeared, you should see them, they're incredible. Oh, They've appeared at... West Hollywood, they appear at Akbar. We're doing a show at Akbar on February 9th. So you're kind of a. Um, I'm the artistic director, whatever oh, you want to say. Wise. Yeah. They that, hired you, or you were no, one of the it people who put it together? Mm -hmm. It just, and Poets and Writers it supports it to some mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. And yeah, at least, I think it's in its third year, actually. Mm -hmm. And they do spoken word performances. All, you know, our oldest member is 84. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's about their history, and a lot of it's about sort of demystifying mm -hmm. what aging is, mm -hmm. and, and trying to break that invisibility wall mm -hmm. that so many gays and lesbians, mm -hmm. and, and anybody in the world, feels mm -hmm. that suddenly you're an age that nobody's looking at you, right. nobody's paying mm -hmm. attention to you, no one's listening to you, mm -hmm. you're silly. You're, mm -hmm. yeah. So we sort of fight all those stereotypes. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really proud of that group. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, uh -huh. I, so the incubator, queer incubator, wise, queer wise that I teach a te lot. Teach where? Um, at various uh, high schools at, for spoken interludes. Mm -hmm. That's an, another group I'm aligned with that I teach eight week se mm -hmm. sessions, one time a week, mm -hmm. short stories. Mm -hmm. So you're going to I'm Kenya. Busy. I'm going, I'm to, going Kenya. to Kenya, mm -hmm. and I'm going to. Uh, I've taken some courses at LA. You know, I didn't go to college, mm -hmm. so um, I feel undereducated. Mm -hmm. You have some regrets about that. Yeah, I tell mm -hmm. her that. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I went to acting school mm -hmm. for three years. <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. I think it's hilarious. You know. <laughs> And I read it was a, a lot. discipline. <laughs> it was a very major discipline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Major. I have discipline, and I did learn that mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yes, I have some regrets. So I'm. I've been taking some classes at LICC, and I'm going to take one in the okay. in the spring. Mm -hmm. So that feels good. I'm reading a lot. I read a lot now, and and I feel like that's what this latter part of my life mm -hmm, mm -hmm, is. Mm -hmm. I want to just learn more. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, um, you know, this is uh, Silver Lake history, and uh, I was thinking in a lot of ways, um, you're kind of a very uh, good mo role model in Silver Lake, and you fit in really well here. I mean, you, were, you came here to be an actor, you're a creative person, uh, you kind of went through the gay lifestyle here, and gay bars and gay baths and everything else, went through the HIV period, being a single parent Silver in Silver Lake, being a single gay parent, <laughs> and um, garnering the support of what Silver Lake has to offer to single gay parents. There's a really a huge lot. community here, and um, now you're a Silver Lake senior. <laughs> uh -huh, and, it's uh, true. 
It's true, and your um, latest performance was in Silver Lake. And that's where Queer Wise meets. Oh, in they Silver meet. Silver Lake. Uh, why don't you say what? Often perform in Silver Lake. What that theater? It's called Spirit the Studio. Which is on Hyperion. Hyperion. Or, where the bathhouse was. Or, <laughs> well, nearby. I mean, not nearby. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. It's above Barbarella, the uh -huh. restaurant. Uh -huh. It's always been sort of a gay friendly. Uh -huh. The woman who Venue. runs that place uh -huh. has always been very gay friendly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now there's a lot of gay stuff going on there. Yeah, which and, is nice. And and also, you know, the the seniors perform at Akbar regularly. Oh, they this do? this will be their I think third or fourth performance at uh, Akbar. Wow. Where we're really trying to bridge mm -hmm. the gap, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. get some younger people in there mm -hmm. to see them, which has happened. Mm -hmm. That's all Silver Lake. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, I mean uh you know, I personally, I retire, and a lot of people who retire or leave their work move on or something, but I know I feel as a very different person than you are that I love this community, I love this place in the world, and it seems like you've really found a groove here. Yeah, I mean, I hope I never, you know, I hope I can stay in this apartment, And but if I couldn't, let's say if something happened and I had to... Mm -hmm. pare down or, or thin down or whatever the words are, <laughs> um, I would find some place in mm -hmm. like, you know, a guest yeah. house or yeah. a smaller uh -huh. place or something. Uh -huh. I really think I'm Silver Lake uh, uh -huh. centric. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Forever. I use that word a lot. <laughs> well, that's great, Michael. Um, and I, I also feel just so strongly that you are a survivor of so many things and that those things have made you stronger and clearer and wiser, that you're kind of really an incredible role model for people and a, a really someone who, who I consider to be um, such an example of what uh, life can be, you know, in the most positive sense. So it's great. And I think Catherine, too, is well on her way. Uh, you know, partly nature versus nurture or whatever, but a lot because of your parenting. And that from reading your book, I can see what a really sensitive parent you've been and will continue to be. So that's great. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with, or do you feel like we're kind of done? I think we're kind of done. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, thank you, and, mm -hmm. and, and thanks for taking the time. I mean, I'm always, mm -hmm. this morning I was sort of thinking, like, well, why why are they talking to me about this stuff? <laughs> but you know but now, right? I do know, and I think that it's... I think that I always have a purpose. Mm. I mean, I, I, I still want to be positive about being gay and be mm. positive about being HIV and be positive about adopting and be positive about... Mm. You know, and, and hope that some younger people can see that all these things are possible. And mm -hmm. I think that they are seeing that now, mm -hmm. more than certainly I was. Right, right. But you've kind of led the way, I think, I hope, a, little a little lot. Bit, yeah, a little bit. great. Yeah. And um, old age, I mean, uh, do you think um, you have to worry a little bit? Or? I worry. Yeah, uh huh, uh huh. Well, I just remind you. I ju just remind you, you're a survivor, and yeah, uh, the universe easy. seems to be taking care of you. Yeah, you know? it does. It mm -hmm. does. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Michael. Well, thank, thank you so, you so much. much. Thank, okay, thank we you. love you. We really do.